Well, good morning once again. Welcome to another service at uh, Grace Community Church. Uh, we're go going to begin to look at a letter that the Apostle uh, Paul wrote to the folks at Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. And uh, this letter that Paul wrote was written probably around 55 AD, and it was uh, written from Athens. Uh, uh, rather, he was, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul came to Corinth from Athens on his second missionary journey, uh, probably about 50 AD. And uh, a lot transpired in between that time since he had uh, been there, and he's going to be dealing with quite a number of issues in this letter to the Corinthians. There was party strife, there was immorality, lawsuits, marriage problems, idolatry, uh, pagan customs, the Lord's Supper, gifts of the Spirit, uh, the uh, resurrection, church finance, and that's not all. Um, the church at Corinth was in the world, which is a good thing, but the problem was that the world was in the church. And these folks couldn't seem to separate themselves from their pagan ways. Their surroundings were too tempting. Uh, the culture around them was too appealing. Corinth was located in southern Greece, west of Athens, it was a great center for commerce, international commerce. It was also known for the immorality there. And in verse 1, Paul declares his de uh, credentials as an apostle. Verse 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. Paul was called to be an apostle on the Damascus Road I came directly from the resurrected, ascended uh, Christ at the right hand of the Father. And Paul is not one of the 12 apostles, uh, but he does have something in common with uh, the 12 disciples. Uh, he was called. Uh, however, the message was not the same. In Matthew 10, verses 5 through 7, we see that Jesus sent forth the 12 disciples, saying, Go not to the Gentiles, rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Paul tells us what the purpose of Jesus' earthly ministry was in Romans 15, verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the Father. He came to minister to the circumcision, Israel, the Jews, and so did the twelve. The Apostle Paul, on the other hand, has new information for this dispensation. His message is that the cross work of Christ is now the means by uh, whereby he will save Jews and Gentiles by simple faith in what the Apostle Paul calls the preaching of the cross. And we see that when we get to verse 18. On that basis, Paul identifies himself as the writer of 1 Corinthians by saying in verse 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. An apostle is a sent one. Paul didn't choose the role for himself. He was called by God. It was the will of God. In verse 1, Paul mentions Sosthenes, our brother. And as often the case, Paul mentions his co-workers. And some scholars suggest he was serving as Paul's stenographer. The only other time that Sosthenes is mentioned is Acts 18, 17, where he uh, was a ruler of the synagogue in Corinth. And it was there that Sosthenes was beaten for his faith in Christ. 
In verse 2, we see the letter is addressed to the church of God, which is at Corinth. Church, in verse 2, is not referring to a building, but rather it's referring to the people. In verse 2, it says, those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. The word sanctified refers to those that have been set apart. Even though Paul is aware that the Corinthians are carnal, and he'll make that statement in chapter 3, positionally they are sanctified in Christ. What is a carnal Christian? He's a person that is motivated by fleshly desires. And it's spelled out for us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. There it's referred to as lusts of the flesh, lusts of the eyes, and pride. The first time this happened was in the Garden of Eden. Satan told Eve, eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil was okay. And she listened to Satan, however, and ate the fruit along with her husband, Adam. And we know that sin entered mankind, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. She saw the fruit was good for food. There's the lusts of the flesh. She saw it was pleasant to the eyes, and that's the lust of the eyes. And then she desired that it would make her wise like God, and that's the pride of life. The next thing we see in verse 2 is that Paul is referring to the Corinthians as saints. This is referring to everyone that is sanctified because they have trusted Christ for salvation. They are saints. All Christians are saints. Christians are saints by virtue of their relationship with Christ. There are some religions that pray to saints that they claim are in heaven. The Bible teaches that saints are here on earth and they worship and pray to God in heaven and no one else. It's not our character or accomplishments that make us saints. It's our faith in Christ and the fact that we are sanctified, set apart for him. The Greek word for saint is holy. The work of Jesus Christ makes a believer holy forever in God's eyes. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Hebrews 10, 14. The Corinthians did not deserve the title of saints. But as we see here in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2, he could say that because Jesus Christ sanctified them. And there's another aspect to those of us that are sanctified, and that is practical sanctification. And that's our Christian walk. Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. For, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 17. And 2 Timothy 2, 21 says, If we do that, then we will be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the ma uh, master's use, and prepared unto every good work. In 1 Corinthians 1, Verse 2, Paul refers to all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. And this letter is not only for the Corinthians' benefit, but to all who belong to the Lord. Notice he says, their Lord and ours. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all believers, wherever they may be. We hear a lot about cancel culture these days. That is not what the Lord desires of us. He says he desires that all be saved. And going on in verse 3, we see the common greeting that Paul used in his letters. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not only... Uh, a greeting, but it's a profound truth. 
God and Christ alone are the source of grace and peace. The grace and peace that Paul is referring to. And grace can be described as the love of God bestowed on the unlovely, the unmerited favor of God. Grace is getting what we don't deserve from God through faith in Christ. And Paul calls it the gospel of the grace of God in Acts 20, 24. The peace in Paul's greeting is a result of God's saving grace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5, verse 1. In verse 4, we see even though the Christians were not the most spiritual, Paul is thankful for what God has done for them. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Christ Jesus. Notice Paul is thanking God on their behalf. Do you suppose gratitude is something that was lacking here? Uh, the carnal-minded man is not thankful, according to Romans 1.21, where it says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful. Spiritually-minded people take time to be thankful for their blessings, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Ephesians 5.20. It was customary for the Apostle Paul to find something thankful for the lives of fellow believers. And the Corinthians, even though they were not the most spiritual people, Paul give, gives thanks. In verse 4, for the grace of God which was given to them by Christ Jesus. In verse 5, Paul explains how the grace of God was manifested to them. That in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. The Greek word for enriched means wealthy, rich. This enrichment includes all that God has provided. Verse 5 says, in everything, but Paul specifically mentions two things, utterance and knowledge. Utterance, referring to the supernatural gift of tongues. And this is understandable since this is written during the transition period between law and grace. When we get to chapter 13, we'll see that the supernatural gifts have ceased. And according to verse 5, they also at this time have the gift of knowledge. And these miraculous gifts demonstrated that God was working among the Gentiles. These gifts have been replaced with something better. Faith, hope, and love. More on that when we get to chapter 13. Now verse 6 points to an important fact. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, it was proof that they had the greatest gift of all, salvation, a relationship with Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1, 7, Paul reminds them that they had everything they needed for a specific purpose so that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 7 tells us it's possible to be gifted and yet not spiritual. In spite of their carnal state, God had gifted them with everything they needed while waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The coming of Christ refers to the rapture. And in verse 8, we have a promise that God will keep us blameless in that day. Verse 8, who shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is sharing this truth with the Corinthians who were graced with many spiritual gifts but lacking in spiritual maturity. 
Verse 8 is a promise from God which does not depend on what we do for him, but it depends on what he has done for us. The one who will sustain us to the end is God the Father. And not only that, but we will be found guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ when the rapture takes place. And as we proceed through this letter, it will become obvious that the Corinthians were anything but blameless. The grace of God is their only hope. The grace of God is our only hope. In verse 9, we see that they will be blameless not because of their faithfulness, but rather the faithfulness of God. Verse 9, God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We can trust God because he loves us with a love that will not let us go. Paul's confidence is based not on their faithfulness, but on the faithfulness of God. His love for us is not based on our performance. It's based on the perfect merit of Jesus Christ. And verse 9 says, you were called. Greek scholars will tell you it's in the aorist tense and passive voice. It means at a given point of time in the past, God sovereignly calls us into the fellowship of his Son. The Corinthians were no longer living in that reality of having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus in Philippians 3.14. The purpose of God's upward call is fellowship with Jesus Christ. And that word fellowship in verse 9 is more than just us getting together here on the Sunday morning, a better understanding would be intimate fellowship. The Apostle Paul said it best in Philippians 3.10, that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Paul wanted to know Christ in such an intimate way so that he would be more Christ-like in every way. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9 says we were called by God to have that kind of fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now up to now, Paul has been has described everything God provided for the Corinthians. And now in 1 Corinthians 1 10, Paul moves from fellowship with Christ to fellowship with each other. They were divisions and, and lack of unity. In verse 10, Paul says, I, I beseech you, or I exhort you. This is not a stern command, but rather it's a, an affectionate appeal. In verse 10, Paul outlines three things that need to be corrected. Number one, they all speak the same thing. Number two, there be no divisions or schisms among them. And number three, they be perfectly joined together. How, how did Paul know about these problems? In verse 11, Paul identifies the source of his information. They were from the household of Chloe. These people were willing to be identified. It wasn't a matter of uh, gossip or, or hearsay. And then in verse 12, Paul lays the blame for the contentions on everyone. Every person was somehow involved. They had individual preferences for certain church leaders. This was causing rivalries among the congregation. First, there was Paul. He was the founder of the church at Corinth. Paul always stressed Christian liberty. It's possible they were excusing, uh, uh, abusing their Christian liberty, their freedom, and they tried to justify it by following Paul. Then there was a, a Paulus. 
the polished speaker, an Alexandrian Jew. Then there, was, uh, there were some that claimed they belonged to Cephas, the Aramaic name for Peter. The Jewish converts probably gravitated to him. And then there were those who said their allegiance was to Christ, which was a good thing, but apparently they rejected all the human leadership. They had an attitude of superiority. Paul asks three thought-provoking questions in verse 13. First, is Christ divided? He's asking, was Christ cut into pieces and given to these different factions uh, to the exclusion of others? Second, was Paul crucified for you? Obviously, Paul is not the source of their redemption. Paul is diverting their attention to the cross of Christ. Third, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Paul is showing them how far-fetched it would be to put himself equal with Christ. The basic meaning for baptism is identification. Paul is appealing to their identification with Christ. In verse 14 through 17, Paul deals with the issue of baptism. He mentions that he baptized Crispus and Gaius, and the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, he said he did not remember. That adds up to a small number. We have to remember that baptism was primarily associated with Israel and would eventually be eliminated entirely. Paul mentions another reason in verse 15. Lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. He didn't want anyone to think he was trying to win converts to himself or give them reason to say, we belong to Paul. Then Paul goes on in verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. Paul's commission was not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Notice Paul did not use clever speech to get his message across. Content is what mattered to the Apostle Paul. And Paul is emphasizing that water baptism has no place in the gospel. Only trusting in the cross work of Christ can save a soul. The statement by the Apostle Paul, for Christ sent me not to baptize, takes on even greater significance when we consider an important fact. In Galatians 1, Paul said the gospel he preached was received by him through a revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation was progressive. Paul did not receive all his instructions at one time. When Paul encountered the risen Savior on the Damascus Road, the Lord said to Paul, You will bear witness both to what you have seen of me and to that which I will appear to you. So we can conclude that in Paul's early ministry, he did some things that are not entirely consistent with his later epistles. In Ephesians 4, 5, Paul said there is one baptism. This is a spiritual baptism, the baptism that takes place when we trust Christ for salvation, mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. Sometimes baptism is referred to an outward expression of an inner work, and I actually agree with that, but it doesn't have anything to do with water, but it has everything to do with the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, keep us ever mindful that we have been 
called by God into the fellowship of your dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep us true to you and your word. We'll ask this in Christ's name. Amen.